So we can do some question and answers here. Um, if you have any questions, then you're uh, certainly free to ask. We're afraid. <laughs> oh, what? Is it hard? Oh, uh, okay, yes. I guess it would be hard. You know, if I was to try and learn all of the other movements that I sound engineer, I'd have to spend probably many, many months trying to go through the scores. It took me so long to learn movement four, which is the second longest movement in the whole suite. Of course, it doesn't even have the greatest number of measures in it. Uh, not to mention that there's those passages that are completely unmetered, that when each, each phrase is counted as a measure of music or a bar, between two bar lines, they are. Yeah, I know this is Bill speaking. Um, first of all, congratulations. Uh, but secondly, did you ever um, <clears throat> study dance? Did you, you like to dance? Because I, I, so many uh, danceable tunes are there. Yes, I, I have, well, I've done a few, uh, a, few a couple, a few years of contemporary dancing. Uh, this is at the same organization which I learned how to use some of the software at the, uh, what's now the Lighthouse Guild International uh, Music School, or Philemon M. D'Agostino Greenberg Music School at Lighthouse Guild International. Uh, I, I took some dance classes in there. They were more uh, contemporary. But I, uh, because my mother has been a dancer for so many years and has been a company with a diverse group of uh, dancers who have come from different backgrounds, I've certainly come to appreciate some of the, the musical forms in that and the, the rhythms. Um, yes, I've, I've developed, uh, I guess, a fascination with some of the not-so-Western forms or maybe the forms that are certainly call them West, but they've had a lot of, lot of uh, Eastern, or uh, back in the olden days, they would have said Oriental background. Yeah. <laughs> Something like flamenco being such a, a kind of an East, uh, maybe originally East meets West thing, going back to the Moorish people in uh, Northwestern Africa, and then going into Spain. But uh, other than that, I really, I think I've paid attention to the music, the, the meters, to mention the things that were Middle Eastern in here were not really dance forms. They were you know, classical music of the Ottoman Empire that came into the Arab world after and during the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So you have a lot of influence from non Western styles, as you just said, many of which probably use scales that were difficult to translate into piano reduction. How did you deal with that? Uh, what, you're talking about scales to translate? Uh, like some some of the forms that you use, were any of them, did any of them use a scale that was like with intervals that you couldn't translate to a piano reduction? And so how did you work around that? Of course, I, I definitely worked around it. In some cases, like for the third section of the fourth movement, I was using a scale known as Mokam Sabah in Arabic tradition. And that contains a, a neutral second interval. In the second degree, it's like D, half flat instead of E flat or E natural. So in some cases I was using either E flat or E natural, um, depending on which direction, sometimes the mood of it, because I couldn't use a, a quarter tone offset on the piano. No such thing. Um, for the uh, for the Hajaz scale, which is the main one that I was using, uh, the ascending form there is a D half flat, which is between B and B natural, of course but I was using the B natural to, to give us a, a, an illusion of being sharper than the descending form. And so you know, that produced the G major chord, the, the major four chord in some cases. Hi Daniel, it's Chloe. Uh, um, yes, Chloe. So you cite some specific both Western and non-Western sort of influences that you refer to. How did you decide where to look? There's just so much. Well, I, I decided to, uh, especially you know, considering the nature of this suite and my, my musical influences are such a, you know, a potpourri, I thought you know, to cover a lot of the important biomes of the world, I wanted to trace out a path that went over Europe and uh, West Asia, Africa, South Asia, because essentially I could have done this whole thing over the Americas, but I didn't really want to work with that too much because the, the, the scale, the diversity would have been maybe a bit less. I would have gone over things
things that were maybe associated with the indigenous peoples, but that would have been maybe full of a lot of pentatonicism and other things that probably come up in some other regions, but again, I think there was a greater array of diversity to pick from, and especially more people lived in Europe, Africa, and Asia, of course, and 90, 95% of, or maybe 90% of the world's population lives on Africa and Eurasia, which is by far the largest land mass in the world, with all of the biomes that are featured there, as well as the culture. Uh, Daniel, this is Matt from Folk Club. Um, I, firstly, I just want to say I was amazed by your music uh, and astounded by the breadth of knowledge and creativity you showed. Uh, I was really curious how you chose to perform Sahara as opposed to the uh, other pieces. What drove that decision? Yeah, well, I wanted to pick something, especially I thought that the outer movements, because they had meter to them throughout the entirety of them, they were more practical to sound engineer. The fourth movement, having those the taksim, or singular taksim, in Arabic or Turkish music, those passages very much tend to have no meter whatsoever. And to try and sound engineer that in sonar, the program that I was using, uh, I, I, and especially the MIDI sequencing, there were a lot of complications. We are trying to have to delete the time signatures and the scores because the score already puts a time signature. And then trying to displace all the bar lines. And, you know, it, it was really, I, I managed, I thought it was better to perform this movie because I could more capture the, the life in those passages. They had no, no absolute rhythm to it. More or less the tonality, the modality, the idea of the makam introduced into that. So Daniel, it's for treatment. I, a, a lot of what we study in Western harmony and the way pieces work tells us about what kind of an arrow of time as you move through keys and tonality and dissonance. I'm just wondering, given the diversity of um, scales and rhythms that you brought to bear, but the relative uh, non-presence, let's say, of that kind of directed harmony, how did you kind of make, how did you think about progress and closure in these pieces, given that you didn't have well, Beethoven okay. harmony to rely on? Well, in a sense, I might have thought of progress, uh, to, not to mention Maybe I didn't think of this too much, but I, I was thinking more on a regional level of sort of the themes of all of these pieces. For some reason, I'm, I'm seeing that within, the, say, the tropical grassland and, and stuff like that, the, these movements where it, it's covering regions that are perhaps warmer or maybe more orderly, maybe not so orderly, but think of the polar regions having the, the harshest harmonies, the more dissonant, the coldest, I, I thought, it was better to capture the, the mood of the setting and to fit the, the harmonies and the rhythms to, to be appropriate. You know, and sometimes, as I said, with the, you know, the innermost movements being more uh, paying attention to the some established cultural forms and then having the outer movements be sort of what has been trends in, in 20th century music, uh, whole tone scales, uh, mm -hmm. polymodality, other facets. Thanks. Daniel, this is Bill again. Uh, were you thinking at all, in, in, I think it was in the temperate expanses, were you thinking at all about Chopin uh, that one time you played this minor chord, does it sound like you were going to play a Chopin nocturne that made you walk away from it? I can't hear you. Uh, it, was, it was sort of reminded me of a Chopin nocturne at, some, at one point. There was a, there was a place you came back to it twice, I think. But yes, and, and perhaps you know I was covering Chopin and all these other composers' homelands, yeah. the temperate expanses going across Europe. I say in my program notes that all those composers in the West had plenty of experience in the temperate biome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all these other composers as well. Did you see discovering gamelan music, which is very much an influence in the sixth movement, perhaps I would say is, well, he, he himself had not been to the, uh, the tropical rainforest, but he heard music from it, and with, yet within the temperate climate of Paris. Mm -hmm. It's all interesting. Daniel, this is Deborah. Yes. 
fantastic job. You worked really hard in just composing the entire thing. I was so proud of you, the way you brought your own artistry to the Sahara movement. The piece is very difficult to perform for solo pianists. Would you consider arranging it for two pianos or maybe even orchestrating some of the movements? Well, I've, I've had several thoughts of that. Uh, from, from earlier on in the composition process, I've been advised even to try and divide up certain portions of the piece to, to make it for four hands or two pianos. Uh, or, or even, I, th I think there were parts of even the fourth movement and others where there was a greater array of density and I had to get rid of some, certain notes that would make it to go from uh, four hands to two hands. Um, and I think it, it's been more like when, whenever I write these notes into the score and the program, I kind of have to think it over and try to play out little passages even slowly myself after the fact, after I've written them down explicitly and figure out how is that supposed to fit two hands. <laughs> yes. Daniel, this is Martha, your dean. Um, <laughs> I, I'm part of the unsophisticated, unsophisticated nature of this question, but I don't compose anything other than memos and emails. And so I wonder what it's like to hear your own piece performed. Is it, do you have moments of, oh gosh, I should have done this, that, or the other thing, or are there moments where you just feel like, ah, oh, I really nailed it? What's it like to hear your own piece? Well, I think there are well, there's certain moments where maybe things are not exactly how I would like them, or perhaps you know, I, I, would, I would really embrace other people's interpretations just like other composers have. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's certainly a, a degree of interpretive freedom that other people can, can express in that. Um, uh, because, well, I've made, I, I think there, there are certain places where I've really annotated the score, other places where I didn't put too many annotations, but I just left it open for the, the interpreter. And do you find you're a good interpreter of your own works? Uh, yes, I, I think certainly with, with that middle movement, I. Mm -hmm. I really made every effort to to produce the right uh, mood and, and to convey pretty much the right uh, the right message, the right uh, sense of where we are in the world when we're going through that. Daniel, Professor Lloyd, uh, I like the reference to uh, "Behold the Lamb of God" and there. What inspired you to do that? that, that <laughs> yeah, especially uh, yeah, going over possibly France in, in the Tempered Bible, uh, it's the French Overture. Yeah. That's very well done. Daniel, it's uh, your friend Mark. Um, although, as the Dean said, as you listen to your piece, um, you may have been subtly critical and said I should have changed. I, I said, as you listen to your own piece, the Dean said, would you be critical of it? Um, I think you may have been critical of it, but we thought it was really perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear. Um, what are you trying to say? Can somebody repeat the question? The sentiment was that you did a wonderful job, and you may have been critical of your own work, but we're really thankful that you put it out there. I, I still don't understand. It was really good. <laughs>